Hello, everyone, and welcome to this sneak session, How Twilio Scaled Through Dev First Security and DevSecOps. Uh, my name is Simon Maple. I'm the VP of DevRel and Community here at Sneak. Uh, and joining me here today is Yash uh, Kosaraju. R Yash, how are you doing? Hey, uh, I'm doing good. How are you, Simon? Very well, thank you. Uh, you're the head of product security at Twilio. Tell us a little bit about uh, about what you do. Cool. So I've been at Twilio close to three years now. My team essentially is responsible for all the security activities in the SDLC, ranging from uh, developer, secure coding, training, threat modeling, security champions, to all the way uh, running our bug money program, doing penetration tests and things like that. And awesome. covering pretty much everything in between with tooling in the SD, uh, in the build pipeline, uh, working with engineers, uh, all of that stuff. Sounds like you're a busy man. Sounds like it's a busy team. <laughs> um, well, welcome to the uh, welcome to the session, and we'll uh, we'll get started, and we'll we'll uh, go deeper in a lot of that uh, going forward shortly. So, in this session, we're going to have a very very brief intro into how modern application development has uh, has changed DevSecOps and changed the way uh, we think about security of of an app. Uh, we'll then cover a little bit of background uh, about Twilio and talk about how. Dev first security, what dev first security and DevSecOps means at Twilio, uh, and go in, into depth on, on certain things about responsibility, how we educate developers, and how we enable developers uh, through the pipeline. Um, Okay, so uh, let's briefly jump into how applications have changed uh, in the last number of years. Uh, Pre-cloud, of course, we looked at developers who were writing uh, their custom code and pulling in a number of open source libraries. That then got dropped, thrown over a wall, if you will, and dropped onto uh, a stack, a platform that was very much handled by the IT and operations team. Today, in a much more uh, uh, cloud-oriented environment, we see developers actually much more responsible for a larger number of things, including parts of the platform that can include your containers, uh, your 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 config, etc. And as developers uh, handle a lot more uh, of these different artifacts and different configuration files. Uh, developers need to be more inclined to uh, maintain, more inclined to secure, and certainly have that understanding of uh, what misconfigurations are as well as uh, how secure their environments are. So, of course, there are a ton of different types of attacks that could be possible at each of these different layers. And as more of the uh, as more of the groupings here from uh, your your you know cloud services, your containers, etc. As more of that becomes available to the developer, the developers need to think much much more about the different types of attack, and that does include you know your config, your unpatched packages, and your operating system uh, ports, which you know maybe previously developers didn't need to think about. All of these need to need to be brought to the developers' attention. So. There are a number of different ways in which that can be done, uh, different toolings in which that can be achieved. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of this in too much depth, but you'll see uh, on this kind of like iceberg uh, picture, as there is typically custom code, which developers have traditionally been more focused on. This is just a small piece of the iceberg, whereas realistically under the covers, Today in the modern applications, there's open source code in libraries that we need to that we need to think about making sure where our vulnerabilities exist in those open source packages, as well as in containers, the hundreds of packages that we pull in, thinking about what con container version we're using, thinking about which which packages we're pulling in, and of course the infrastructure that binds all of that together, uh, the code that we uh, that we use in the config, the scripts, whether it's Terraform, Kubernetes, whatever it is that pulls all of that together, we need to make sure that in this entire software supply chain, uh, we're, we're not just writing and maintaining, but we're securing uh, and being very conscious of where uh, attacks, et cetera, uh, can come in. So uh, with that, I did promise there only be a few slides. Uh, I'm going to jump across over to uh, to Yash again, um, and yeah, let, let's have a, uh, a discussion about some of these uh, some of these pieces. And, and we'll first talk. Why don't we have a little bit of background about about Twilio? Maybe the journey Twilio has been on, in, in, and, and the changes in uh, the style of application that you're looking to support, uh, Yash. Um, and um, and I'd love to kind of like know who's responsible for those different areas as well. Cool. So Tulia has a wide variety of services we provide, right? And that kind of trickles down to things that the security and trust team uh, needs to secure and work with engineering. Uh, in terms of how it's divided between the team, so we have multiple sub-security teams. We have product security, cloud security, enterprise security, well management, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
more relevant to this discussion, I guess I'll uh, focus a little more on cloud and product and how they kind of work in this cloud native environment of like Kubernetes, because you could pretty much make an argument Kubernetes is a cloud security responsibility versus it's not, and then where do containers fit in, right? That's been a interesting debate over the last few years. So the way we try to do it at Twilio is everything that's written by our developers is product security. And then once you talk about how that's deployed on the infrastructure, that's cloud security and that's super high level. Uh, so Kubernetes security is something we work together on. Um, everything that's AWS and cloud security in general, that goes to the CloudSec team. Um, security stuff relating to the code that's written internally, the applications we build uh, and containers and all that portion of it uh, lies within product security. What, what are the typical interactions then between the security teams and the dev teams in those instances? So why don't we take uh, why don't we take something which is much more on the application side of uh, of you know maybe open source libraries or, or, or you know their own code as well? Um, when does the when do the dev w w where is that line between where dev find things where where um, the security team come to the devs with issues? How does that work? The way I like to think about it is we work with the engineering teams to help them write more secure code uh, and build more secure products for Twilio's customers. Uh, I, I don't want to draw a line of like who finds issues. Anyone within Twilio can find an issue, come to us and say, how do we fix this? Like that's probably my dream if like engineering can, you know, start thinking about that, come to us and say, hey, how do we fix this? And that to some extent happens within Twilio. The way we do it is you have a security champions program. So there is a security champion nominated in pretty much every engineering team. And they have a single point of contact within the security team who's their security partner. And they work pretty closely on a regular basis talking about the changes the team is making, new products, new features, and then deciding as a team what security activities need to be done. It could be like, let's do a threat model or uh, let's do a quick pen test on this or just let's talk through the flow and make sure everything's okay so uh, it's a team effort and that's really interesting i think it's a common thing to see as security champions or security mavens program and these they these these are the kind of things that clearly you know we've seen success with for, for a number of different people in twilio specifically um developers you know realistically when we talk to a developer security is not going to be high on their list in terms of things they want to get done that day so how do you how do you really energize the developers into wanting to be a part of this program or wanting to be educated in security I think as long as we make security asks reasonable and uh, possible, I think it'll work. If I go to them and say, here's a vulnerability to fix, there's no public fix available. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but you need to fix this. That's not going to work. But mm -hmm. if I go and say, this is the vulnerability, this is why it's important. This is what are the repercussions of not fixing this. And this is how we can help you fix it and sort of show them a path forward of fixing stuff without breaking something else. I think developers are open to security. From my experience, at least at Twilio, uh, everyone wants to do the right thing, but it's how do we help them do it? And that's mm -hmm. the important part that we uh, try to focus on. Mm -hmm. And as a an individual that is part of a security champions program, so you mentioned there's one person from each team or each squad in, in Twilio that is part of this in this program. What should I expect? Do I get educated internally by the by the security teams? How do I interact with other security champions? What's what's my kind of different day to day? Um, so we do have um, a SaaS secure coding training for pretty much all engineers at Twilio, but when it comes to champions, we recently rolled out like in-person, well, virtual, of course, right now, but virtual in-person uh, security training based on what they're building. Uh, we also have a advanced security champions program where they can sort of enroll and do offensive, defensive, and cloud security um, courses slash uh, challenges in a CTF styled environment um, and then sort of earn points as part of that. We also have swag in there. Um, and at the end of the day, if they complete all of these, we also give them more uh, responsibilities and privileges, which usually are reserved for security team. Mm -hmm. So so it's kind of like uh, the more they the more they show, the more you enable them in, in terms of uh, in terms of what they can what they can yes. do. 
right right yeah. um in 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 terms of then how they apply themselves within their engineering org um how do they do, do they do they fit into the design a little bit earlier do they inject themselves into code reviews uh, how do they then engage with the engineering teams uh, you mean the champions or the partners the, the champions yeah so the champions are part of the engineering team, right? So they would be part of the whole end-to-end -end process that the team works on. And once they've gone through these trainings and some things that we do there are like, okay, you do threat models from the dev side of things. Now let's switch sides. Why don't you come join us as part of the security squad when doing a threat model for another team and then sort of enable them to think like an attacker during threat models. And, and that, kind of goes on for all the different uh, challenges we have. And at the end of it, it kind of helps them in the long run of like when they're building a design for a new feature, they start to think, okay, how can this be broken? And that kind of helps reducing the number of issues that my team would find uh, later on in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and for other individuals in the team who are not part of the security champions team, if they need support, if they need help, do they go to the champions or would they come directly to the uh, to the security team? Uh, they can come directly to the security team. Uh, I would not turn any developer away if they come and say, help us do the right thing. Uh, mm -hmm. However, uh, they can go to the security champion, they can go to the security champion and through them come to the partner. I'm open to like any interaction that they want to have. Awesome. Awesome. And I think that's a, yeah, like I say, it's a, it's, it's turning into a real best practice, I think, in, of having a security champions program and, and a really great way of developers almost like holding each other responsible for, for a high level of security practice within an organization, within an engineering team, um, which sounds good. Um, so let's, why don't we talk a little bit about um, how a, a pipeline in Twilio would, would work. So a developer, first of all, actually, who owns that pipeline? Do you have like DevOps style teams? Is, uh, is there developers who kind of uh, work on those pipelines as well? Who, where, where does the ownership sit? So we have a platform team that owns the whole pipeline, which developers then use to sort of build their features or products on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, whenever we want to put tools in the pipeline, it's basically working with the platform team that owns those pipelines to sort of enable us. And in my opinion, like the team, the DevOps team that owns these pipelines are basically a secret sauce that enables security to succeed because you're essentially going and saying, I have a tool which I want to put in your stuff. Please let us do it. Mm -hmm. And and so a developer now wants to push some push some code into production. So they make their code changes. At what stage? What's the first stage? Do they start testing, uh, perhaps in an automated way or even manually uh, for for security issues? So for security issues, uh, the way we are trying to do it is have as many checks as possible in the pipeline, right? Uh, all the things from code ownership checks to secrets in code to uh, dependency security, static code analysis, all of that stuff as early as we can and give feedback via comments and pull requests or Slack messages or combinations. Or if it even works, we may even uh, create tickets in the right team's queue if uh, all of these automations sort of uh, work with each other. Mm -hmm. And what's the what's the most important way to to get that feedback to a developer that there's an issue how you know what's the what's the feedback cycle and how does a developer expect to to resolve those i think the developers would have is uh, the true false positive rate should be pretty low uh, we've had uh, code analysis tools uh, submit comments on prs and people actually look at them immediately and uh, one of uh, my team's learning in the past is some of the tools that we have used have had a higher rate of false positives than others and then people immediately look at those if they see 10 high findings that need to be fixed because they want their code to be secure but mm -hmm. at the end of the day if they find out that eight of those 10 are false positives they're going to lose trust in the tooling we run um, so i think that's a big uh, important issue for me and my team is whatever we run whatever we tell the developers to do and whatever type of feedback we give there needs to be that consistent high rate of uh, efficiency and uh, less false positives 
uh, to maintain trust and sort of get people to look at those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a certainly one of the most important things I've seen as well in 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 terms of when developers have time to to to, to fix, they don't want to fix things that are you know just frustrating them in terms of yes, I know I've got I see twenty issues here, but only two of them are real issues, kind of, kind of, kind of a thing. Um, yeah. Now, 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 you use, you use um, uh, Sneak today, and one of the quest one of the uh, big things which we which we care about as a as a developer tool uh, in security is how we make uh, um, actionable information back to the developer. Um, in terms of in terms of how much remediation. And things you expect developers to to do straight away, or to you know do to their backlog. How important uh, a push do you have on remediation and fixing vulnerabilities in uh, within your security org? It depends on the criticality of the issue. Uh, certainly, we're not going to say here's like hundred issues, go fix all of them now. Uh, the way we're trying to solve this is categorize those issues based on severity, fix availability, uh, exploit maturity, has this been exploited before? Is it in our edge service or not? And based on a bunch of factors sort of categorize them and then use our well management standard, uh, which has defined SLAs for certain criticality within uh, all of Twilio and then use that to sort of drive remediation uh, in a slow but progressive manner versus trying to tackle like everything at once. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about automation actually in a, in a, in a little mm -hmm. sec as well, go into more depth on that. But I think, you know, in, in terms of vulnerabilities that you find in your pipeline, you do know blocking right now today, I believe, in your in your pipeline. But talk, talk, talk us uh, through some of the automation that you have that kind of uh, generates those tickets for you. Sure. So the first problem we tried to solve was code ownership, because more often than not, do you find a vulnerability, you dig it dig through to get to the source code, but then the next question is, who does this even belong to? And more than once in the past have done like a good blame to see who made changes, ping them, they may be offline, may not be in the company, then you know, go down that sort of rabbit hole to finally figure out who owns that piece of code. So one way we're uh, solving that problem at Twilio is asking engineers to put a about YAML file in their code repos with basic metadata of that code that we want to know which team the code's owned by, what your project they work off of, what's their Slack channel, all of those things. And then we're also putting in all of our security tooling into the pipeline, like container scanning, code scanning, dependencies, all of those. And we're building a sort of ticketing framework uh, which essentially talks to all of these tools, gets results, goes and looks for the about YAML file, and then based on certain rules we write, it goes and files tickets into uh, the exact queue that the teams would look at. So essentially, the teams then don't have to go and sift through like a bunch of results, figuring out which ones are actually applicable to them. They get those tickets in their Jira queue, in the backlog where their engineering managers or product managers can look at them and sort of help prioritize uh, who works on what. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And and how how is so automation is like absolutely key in terms mm -hmm. of the adoption. Is that is that how you see it? Um, is there is there anything you do outside of the pipeline that can really engage developers in that in that adoption of testing testing earlier before that before they enter the pipeline? So security education is a key there, right? We do uh, in-person and sort of online security education and basically walk through different scenarios that have happened in the past and how they can happen again. We've also recently started a lunch and learn um, practice within Twilio where we just take like an hour instead of a day long training and talk through some of the things that we're doing. Like this is not necessarily a wash top 10, but it's like, hey, how, do, how does Twilio do dependency security? why are secrets and code bad? And then sort of talk through some of the bigger projects that we have taken, the motivations behind them, and also get developers familiar to the tools that we use and what to expect from those tools and what not to expect from them. Awesome. And I think there's obviously the differences between the kind of the pipeline and, and um, educating the developers is, is that you can, you can teach developers, you can educate developers, but you can't force a developer to do anything uh, necessarily. Whereas in the pipeline and the automation, everything gets policed and everything gets tested every time so it's such a such a key piece there um it is 
in, in, in terms of, you also actually also did some automation around Sneak, uh, more recently mm -hmm. in uh, Sneak Watcher. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So we rolled out Sneak for all of our code and then realized there are code changes like creating new projects, deleting, archiving, and those weren't reflecting back into Sneak in a native uh, fashion. And we didn't really want to go into Sneak every week or every couple of days and say, re-import everything to maintain state. And one of my engineers was like, let's build automation around this. And then essentially Sneak Watcher keeps our code repositories in sync with Sneak. So whenever a change happens in our code, for example, say a project is archived, right? That triggers off a webhook, uh, Sneak Watcher goes into Sneak and then makes the relevant changes to the projects within Sneak. Awesome. Uh, and you use the Sneak API for that, I presume? Yep. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, and I'd love to kind of like talk a little bit going more towards this, the the path of success because I think this is always a tough a tough question in terms of how you feel uh, you are being successful in your security programs, how you see developers being successful. Um, what are the kind of things you measure today in terms of the your security programs? So that's something we have recently started working on. So being completely honest, uh, I don't have the full answer of like what does success metric look like for a security team. But uh, the way we're trying to approach this is first surface a dashboard of, okay, here are all the vulnerabilities per business unit. And then uh, let BU leaders be able to see that and sort of get that visibility as one single dashboard from all of our tools. Um, and the way we're sort of diving deep into that is also breaking it down on like which phase of our capabilities were those vulnerabilities found. So basically imagine a graph of sorts which says threat modeling found X percent of your issues versus bug bounty found Y percent. And the more we, we mature, I foresee that graph being heavy on X, which is the number of ones or the percentage of the vulnerabilities found during threat modeling, code reviews, uh, champion syncs, and stuff like those um, versus bug bounty. The idea being we try and eliminate vulnerabilities before they even hit our code. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I, I think you kind of like, uh, talk a little bit about how much uh, you valued the dev time previously mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of uh, giving giving tools and processes etc that 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 you know make aren't slow speed up that uh, that that pipeline reducing false positives so you know what what they're working on are the critical critical things that are actually issues um, what kind of uh, feedback do you give to developers via like dashboards and things like that if they were if they did you know how do they know what to work on next in in a backlog, for example. So that's what I leave it up to the security partners and champions. So we also are building dashboards for each uh, champion teams or BUs, which basically shows a list of open security tickets in each team's queue and also open task tickets in the security queue, which uh, relates to those teams, right? It's more of a two-way street. The team can come and say, do X, Y, and Z for our security, and those three tickets will show up in the dashboard. And every time the security partner and the security champion meet, they kind of look at this, be like, hey, you have five tickets in your backlog. Can you sort of prioritize those in your next sprint planning? Engineering mm -hmm. can come to us and say, hey, you have these two tickets that we asked you to work on. Can you actually get to those soon? So uh, that dashboard working with those champion sinks is sort of the way we envision um, sort of working through those tickets and dashboards and things like that. Got it. And that's interesting that you talk about, you know, different tickets getting into into like the next sprint or a future sprint. What, what kind of um, uh, prioritization would a security issue get over a new feature or a functional bug? Uh, how do the how do the teams balance that? Is it mostly based on SLAs or is there uh, other things involved? There is SLA and we're also working with teams to sort of try and dedicate some portion of time for security asks on a regular basis. Um, it also depends on the criticality of the bug. Uh, it could be, for example, there could be a bug which is pretty benign and has not been exploited. There's no known exploit, so that could take backseat. But once we have evidence that, hey, this is being exploited in the wild, we need to sort of get, go and get this done now, that that's when the yeah. conversation changes to, this is why it needs to be done. So essentially the bottom line is, 
unless we have a valid uh, reason to sort of ask dev to sort of stop what they're doing and work on security we don't usually do that it's security i it should not be a hammer that we use and say go do this it should be more of a collaborative uh, working session between engineering and uh, us in the long term to sort of build that trust relation and sort of find that balance between security and uh, feature. Mm. And I think th this is really interesting actually and I think if we were to even take that earlier so mm -hmm. let's say there's a, a developer's working on a new feature and they're gonna they need a new package or they need to use a specific docker container um, there's there's a balance really between you giving the developer enough uh, enough space in which they can be creative in which they can choose different tools or different uh, libraries that they want to use but there's also you wanted to make sure that there is maybe guardrails or some some way in which that developer is being sensible with what they choose how do you balance that and, and how do you know when to give developers more kind of rope uh, uh to, to to be able to express themselves more freely i think uh, that's the change of thinking that you need to look at in this case because it's security is not just responsible for security of Julia, right we are here to enable developers to embed security into their products and they're ultimately responsible for their products so the way i look at it is we give them the right tools the right results the right guidance and we kind of make a collaborative decision of like what takes precedence mm -hmm. awesome yes thank you very much this has been a really really interesting chat and uh, thank you for joining us today thanks simon